Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. From Evanston, Illinois, we welcome for their first appearance on our True Story Adventure series, Mr. and Mrs. Willis Butler. Mrs. Butler was raised in Ethiopia, the daughter of an American missionary, and with her husband, returned there recently after an absence of 17 years. And here, in the still primitive and rugged land, she relived the memories of her childhood, of the fierce desert tribesmen, the trappings of Ethiopian royalty, and swift herds of wild game, seldom seen even by the white hunters of Africa. For the next 30 minutes, we share the adventurous journey of Mr. and Mrs. Willis Butler on a return to Ethiopia. Bold Journey, your television passport to the exciting, colorful world of adventure. Brought to you each week by the Ralston Purina Company of Checkerboard Square, St. Louis. Makers of rice checks, wheat checks, rye crisp, and instant Ralston, the famous foods in the checkerboard packages. And here, speaking for Ralston, is that celebrated cereal salesman, Lee Goodman. <clears throat> Attention. In attacking an ordinary bowl of cereal, the most important thing to remember is how to keep it from bogging down in sugar and milk. Now, this is a battle you never have with a grown-up cereal like Wheat Chex. No, sir. But with some cereals, a classic tactic is to pour the milk carefully down the side of the bowl instead of right on top. This attack is known as outflanking the flakes. Then we have the undercover assault, first used during the famous battle of the uh, bumber shoot. Finally, there's the underground technique. You just don't pour the milk into the bowl. You send it through a pipe inserted from below. Well, with wheat checks, you don't have any battle at all because it's over the top every time, men. Wheat checks are a grown-up cereal, you see, with a pronounced whole wheat flavor. They stay crisp and crunchy the whole bowl through. So if you want a cereal that doesn't meet its Waterloo in sugar and milk, march right down to your grocery store for a package of Wheat Chex, the grown-up cereal from Checkerboard Square. And now, here to begin tonight's true story adventure is Jack Douglas. Despite its proud heritage of independence, its long history as a nation reaching back to the Bible, and even the primitive beauty of its countryside, the kingdom of Ethiopia is the one region most often overlooked by the African traveler. One reason, perhaps, is that even today, outside its capital city, Ethiopia remains a tough, rough, even overpowering country, a nation of vast contrasts. In short, a place that one would choose for a visit only for very strong reasons. Well, Mrs. Willis Butler had such a reason, for virtually every memory she has of her childhood is tied to this land of the Lion of Judah. And so last summer, the Butler's journey to Africa's oldest independent nation. And here to tell the story of this adventure are Mr. and Mrs. Willis Butler of Evanston, Illinois. Hello, Mrs. Butler. Hello, Jack. How are you, sir? Hello, Jack. It's nice to see you. Mrs. Butler, how old were you when your parents took you to Ethiopia? I was two years old, Jack, when my father gathered up his family and set sail for Ethiopia, where he was to be a medical missionary. I see. Now, Mr. Butler, was this your first visit to Ethiopia? Yes, as a matter of fact, it was, Jack, although, of course, I had heard a lot about Ethiopia for about 10 years from my wife. Well, now, Mrs. Butler, was there some inner reason uh, why you wanted to return to Ethiopia beyond perhaps the opportunity to relive some of your childhood memories? Well, of course, Jack, I wanted to see the people and the places that I'd known when I was a child there, but I think more especially, I wanted to show the country to Bill. Surely. Just in case your husband begins using some uh, Ethiopian terms uh, during the course of the narration uh, of the film that we're about to see, I wonder if you'd give us an idea of what the Ethiopian language is like or perhaps the dialect that you learned. Well, one of the main dialects is the Gala language, and I learned to speak it like a native. And I might say to you, Gari Bulteni, Atam Jirtu. What does that mean? Which means, how are you? We're just fine, how are you? Thank you very much, Mrs. Butler. And now, Mr. Butler, is our journey by air or by sea? 
We start by air deck from New York's Idlewild Airport. Air travel makes it so much more simple to get to Ethiopia today than it was when my father-in-law, 17 years ago, set out for Ethiopia. Today, it's just a matter of two days, and you're in Addis Ababa, 1,700 miles on the map of Africa, south from Cairo. Look at the mountainous terrain we cover as we hit Ethiopia from the north, which gives way finally to the fertile plateau country. And finally, here we are in the city of the New Flower, seeing it from the site that Emperor Menelik first looked down upon the valley, and he said, I'm going to call this the city of the New Flower, Addis Ababa, as we look at it from our hotel room the downtown business district. It certainly looks like a very modern city, doesn't it? Yes, it is. This, of course, being the capital of the country, many different languages, the Amharic language being the main language of Ethiopia. There are many picturesque ways in this modern city of getting around town. This is the horse-drawn Gary. And then they have a little motorized version of it. For short, they just call this the MG, the motorized <laughs> Gary. A lot of the people from out in the country come into town in style. Burros carrying the produce down to the market. The burros doing this African can-can <laughs> on the way into market. Animals are not the only bearers of goods. The people also carry very heavy loads. They think nothing of it. And this is what you see any day in the week on the way to Addis Ababa. Everybody seems to be in a hurry in this country. One American who had spent a good many years here said this is the walkingest, talkingest country I've ever seen. We've come down now 200 miles to the east of Addis Ababa by air, where at 7 o'clock in the morning, as the animals return from their water hole, you can sometimes see them racing through the swamps. Antelope down there. Ethiopia has just as many animals as the other African countries to the south. 36 oryx trying desperately to get away from our airplane one of the villages of the dreaded Donakils, one of the reasons why it's still unsafe to travel alone out here in the desert area. That name was the Donakils? The Donakils, Jake. One of the most primitive peoples on the earth today. Now, we've left that area and are flying over the old rock-hewn church community of Lalabella, tucked away in the mountains at 10,000 feet, with these 11 monolithic churches carved out of solid rock 850 years ago under old King Lalabella. Rather than breaking up the rock and reassembling it, they've just carved the rock as it stands and interconnecting these 11 churches by means of mysterious subterranean tunnels. It would take about eight days by a mule caravan to get up here if it weren't for the airplane. Continuing on into the interior of Ethiopia, to Mizantafri, and up there on that hill is the home site of Charlie Haspels, an American missionary. Charlie's on the way back from the airport He's bringing in the Christmas mail. This is February, and the mail is right on schedule <laughs> from the United States. They're really out here in the middle of nowhere. Is he a doctor? No, Charlie is a missionary administrator, you might say, but they do have a doctor here, and Charlie's responsible for the overall program. Lois, his wife from New Galilee, Pennsylvania, has joined Charlie out here. This is where the doctor works, this little galvanized iron clinic but it's really a wonderful thing for the people here. There is the doctor at the left, Campbell Miller. Is he an American also? No, he's a Scottish lad, as a matter of fact, working for the American mission. And these different patients have come in. Some of them have walked for two or three days to find the doctor. Of course, kids all over the world around, I think, have the same reaction to medicine. That's See right. that little one turn away? It sure did. Well, Campbell has examined this woman, and an operation was found necessary, but she said, not until I get the consent of a witch doctor. The physician very wisely pointed out this fellow who happened to be a witch doctor and happened to be a patient at the same time. He said, ask him. The witch doctor said, yes, the American has cut on me and has helped. If I were you, I'd let him cut on you. And so you have a witch doctor sanctioning modern medicine in Ethiopia today. Charlie has been very industrious with this channel he dug for six months. He has diverted some water from a little jungle stream. There's a 30-foot difference between it and the level of the jungle stream. So Charlie built his own little hydroelectric plant in this little shack where a turbine is operated. The do-it-yourself program in Ethiopia, huh? And he learned it all by correspondence. Remarkable. Charlie has electricity 24 hours a day out in the middle of the jungle. 
and he pipes the surplus water into the house where he has tap water. Out here in the interior, we travel now by automobile up this road, 750 miles to the north, traveling on the way through this rugged terrain, which is so typical of Ethiopia. Obstacles to navigation occasionally, like this fellow up ahead. I said, look out. But my driver said, don't worry. He wants us to run over his devil he thought was following. They've tried to scratch out the name on the top of that tunnel, Mussolini, of course. We zoom out of that tunnel a few miles further. We arrive at the Bati Market, right at the edge of the Donakil Desert, the desert inhabited by those people who lived in that village we saw from the air. Everything is very primitive, and it takes a long, long time to arrive at the price. The camels had been through this many times before with their masters, and so they get bored with the whole thing and one by one drift off to slumberland. This was the first Donakil lady we had met, very reluctant, as you can see, to be photographed. Well, now, a few moments ago, Mr. Butler, when you mentioned these people, you inferred that probably they weren't very good company. Just why? Are they a warrior people? Yes, they still bestow admiration and glory on the man who has killed a lot of people. Killing is the royal road to glory, and you can see the tools he uses, which can strike terror into any traveler's heart. And before the airplane, you had to travel right through their countryside, days and days from any police station. So their activities are rather difficult to control but the government has been trying to discourage with the gallows their murderous practices. This is the kind of terrain we travel through. These mountains which made travel so difficult before the airplane. At Aksum, a French expedition is excavating ancient Ethiopian structures. We find the 70 foot high obelisk. This is the oldest known object made by man found so far in Ethiopia, said by scientists to be at least 16 centuries old. This 120-foot one was toppled years ago. Here is the pool where, according to legend, the Queen of Sheba swam, Haile Selassie, of course, claiming that his lineage goes back all the way to the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. And it was here in this little coronation place that the old kings of Ethiopia were crowned, right on the stone dais. The old crowns that deck their heads. The gentleman in charge of them gave us his personal fly switch as a token of the occasion. A very Christian gentleman and a man in charge with a great responsibility here in looking after these precious and historically important crowns. And look at this beautiful handwork, all done here in Ethiopia. They look as if they might be worth a king's ransom. I don't know their exact value. Hundreds of years old, really, with their semi-precious jewels, but priceless in worth because of their great historical importance. We left the city of Aksum because we had heard about a monastery not too many hours away. Monastery of Debradamo, up on top of that huge rock, very formidable location we were to discover. We continued by automobile as far as we could travel, but we had been grossly misinformed, to put it mildly. We were told that it was going to be a two-hour walk, but they neglected to say that it was down 5,000 feet and up another 5,000 feet. So we arrived totally unprepared in street shoes and ordinary clothing, no ropes or climbing gear of any kind. When we finally got up here 5,000 feet exhausted, we saw this reception committee peering down on us out of the clouds like something out of Shangri-La. And they told me, Jack, I'd have to take off my shoes here because I was going to be treading on sacred ground. And then look at the 75-foot cliff that I had to go up by means of this rope. It's the only way you can get up there. It was a means of defense. Fortunately, there was a man hauling away on a rope which was tied to my waist. And so with his efforts and my last ounce of strength, I managed to swing my leg over and I had arrived. Down below, my wife, waiting rather dejectedly, this being a monastery, she wasn't allowed on top. Holy ground, visited by few men from our civilized world. I wondered what I'd find. Thank you very much, Mr. Butler, Mrs. Butler. Part two of your true story adventure will continue in just a few moments. First, here's a word from our happy inhabitant of Checkerboard Square, Lee Goodman. At last, Inspector Crunch was closing in on the gang of cheese counterfeiters. He had traced them to the back room of the skullduggery delicatessen on the waterfront. Peeking through a back window, he observed their operation. The inspector entered without knocking. Nobody move, he commanded. You are suspected of printing imitation Swiss cheese. 
From his coat, he drew out his trusty package of rye crisp crackers and made himself a snack. He munched it expertly. Just as I thought, he said. You're making counterfeit Swiss. The imitation is perfect except for one detail. The flavor is that of Limburger. And the proof is in the rye crisp. Because rye crisp always brings out the true, genuine flavor of any cheese. You are under arrest. <sighs> Boy, I sure like these stories with arresting dialogue. Especially when it's about cheese and rye crisp. In fact, I eat it up. You see, nothing brings out the best in a slice of cheese like the tantalizing taste of rye. And right here in Rye Crisp, you get the real flavor of 100% whole grain rye in its most munchable, crunchable form. Rye Crisp, the smorgasbord cracker in the checkerboard package. And so, Jack, this is what we found up at the top of Debradamo, the oldest surviving Christian church in all of Ethiopia, with these men standing out in front in all of their religious finery. I was deeply impressed when they told me that this was no particular religious festival or celebration of any kind, but they were just appreciative of having travelers come their way. There are about 100 monks in all who live up here on top and who have given their lives to the Coptic Christian Church, Ethiopia having been Christian, of course, for over 16 centuries. They were very kind. They took me across this plateau over to one of their stone Tigrayan style houses where we were entertained with food and water. And I was so thirsty that I threw all hygienic standards to the wind and gulped the water down. Later, I got curious. Where did you get my drinking water, I said. Why, right down here, sir, in these stone reservoirs. We got yours from this one. Last year's rainwater, you know. But apparently, the algae had devoured all the germs, and it was quite safe. We left Deborah Damo, flying now to Ruth's old hometown, Gori. And you see how we travel in this C-47 with the cargo lashed across the aisle from us. Often it's live and the chickens cluck madly as you take off, quite interesting. <laughs> Coming in for a landing here at the Gore Airport, which is on top of a 5,000-foot mountain. And Jack, you never worry about which way the wind blows in Ethiopia when you're landing. You always land uphill and take off downhill. The airline terminal building, our only touch with civilization out here in the interior, the radio shack. Much different, of course, than in the days when Ruth lived here. Now the airline limousine takes you into town. Not exactly the most steady ride in the world, but you get there and you're glad to have it. Another change since Ruth lived here, electricity. Unknown at that time, provided today by this Italian between 7 p.m. and midnight, no meters in the households, the charges being determined by the number of light bulbs of various wattages they own and he sells all the bulbs in town. <laughs> The skies began to darken just a bit as we arrived at the former compound where Ruth lived, the rain beating down on these galvanized iron roofs. And she said this was a very familiar sound as a child. She used to go to sleep during the rain beat down on the metal roofs. The skies finally cleared and we took off once again from this gory airport. The American pilot telling me that this is one airfield, Mr. Butler, where you must be airborne or else at the end of the runway because you're automatically at 5,000 feet as you zoom off this carrier deck in the jungle. Magnificent scenery, very spectacular and dramatic. We've changed to automobile here now. Often in the mountainous terrain, the warm air meeting the cold causes rather eerie scenes like this fog drifting up the mountainside. Since Ethiopia is so mountainous, it's quite natural that the people should live on the mountainside and be known more or less as mountain people, really. It was here in this hut that we met Otto Gudeha, 48 years old, who was the cook back in Gore for Ruth's father. Here he is starting his typical day with the rest of the family gathered round for morning prayer. Mamo, their young son, leaves for school, and these Ethiopian lads think nothing of walking up to two hours to school, most of it uphill. The little sister here bringing the firewood, the other sister bringing water from a half mile down the mountainside. One of the ironies of Ethiopia, water being so precious, even though the heavy monsoons deluge the countryside, but it all runs off to Egypt. So they use water very sparingly. Having no beauty shop down at the corner, Mother is the local beautician. You notice with this double-edged razor blade. 
how she works on the hair, the neighborhood gang coming around to watch the proceedings, the little boy's hair cut in the opposite manner with the hair left in the center. We're getting closer to meal time and Martha is preparing the grain here, pounding it in the old mortar and pestle method. This grain they call dura and it'll be used to make their bread, which in the Amharic language they refer to as anjera. This will be eaten with the wat, as they call it, which is a very hot, and that's putting it mildly, dish, somewhat similar to our chili. It has 21 different spices in it. And this bread will sort of cut the hotness a little bit. Actually, it didn't cut it too much for me. It was very hot. There's the wat in the center. You have bean wat, chicken wat, all kinds of wat. So you never ask what's for lunch in Ethiopia. It's always wat. <laughs> Even the babies eat the hot what? We left our family, continued on from Dembodolo, Ethiopia, and don't you like these musical Ethiopian names? It took us eight hours to travel this 33 miles in four-wheel drive because we're descending 7,000 feet. This is the dry season, by the way. We didn't wait around for the heavy rains to arrive. The Sako River Bridge I got out and examined the floor of the bridge. It doesn't exactly inspire one with confidence, but we made it. Our immediate destination here, Pokwo, the city of light in the Anuak language. There's lots of game around, and every man carries a spear. The main activity of the day begins at 9.30 for the men as they all gather under the biggest shade tree in town where they'll spend the rest of the day, lying here peacefully on these sleeping mats with the wooden pillow rests. After all, it's about 130 degrees out in the sun. You can't blame them, I guess. Very sensible. The Barrow River is right here alongside the village, and so the women come down and get the water. And since the men must survive under this big shade tree, they bring them food and water at intervals. And that's all that the men do all day that's long? All they just do. sit around? Just take it easy. You notice how the women are decorated here with the scar tissue. A little junior with his beads looking out wide-eyed at the world. <laughs> 300 yards downstream from the village, we saw these crocodiles which infest the Barrow River. Our missionary host came up with a rather astounding suggestion, I thought, at this point. He said, let's all take a swim in the river. I said, well, you must be crazy, Don. He said, no, there's one sandbar where I've shot at the croc so many times, they know not to come here. And he said, the only thing we might have to worry about is a few travelers from upstream not acquainted with the local rules. That's Ruth in there. Drums called us out of the river soon afterward and we discovered that a dance was being held in our honor. Even if it was uh, 130 degrees out in the sun, I thought the only proper and polite <laughs> thing to do... Is that you there? That's me. <laughs> well, I've never seen anything like this here before, he says. Probably he hasn't. We noticed the Coptic cross again in miniature yes, scale. The influence of the Christian church and also the work of the missionaries. You were improvising a little bit here, weren't you, Mr. Butler? I don't know what kind of a dance you'd call this, Jack, but we were having fun. After this, I couldn't walk for about a week. The local telegraph service arriving. You've heard of the African runner. Well, here he is. <laughs> adding his telegram on the traditional forked stick to our host, Don McClure. And Don looks at this, he says, it's good word, an airplane's going to take you back to Addis Ababa very quickly. After arriving at the airport in the capital, we happened to notice that at the same time, another plane was arriving, bringing in His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie. These little dogs always precede him wherever he goes. And here he comes with full appropriate dignity, the Lion of Judah. He's quite beloved by his people, isn't he? Yes, he certainly is. And the entire royal family, they're sort of symbols for everybody of the head of the country. This is the main religious celebration of the entire year. This is what has brought Haile Selassie back to Addis Ababa. After a brief absence in eastern Ethiopia, he reviews it all. The following morning at 6 a.m., it's very cold as the high mass is celebrated. We hear the chants of these priests who have gathered here, swaying back and forth exotically, leaning on their praying sticks, assisted by the drummers. A little later, the 
formal proceedings got less and less formal. People began to feel like dancing very spontaneously, engaging in what they call their country fun, sort of a reenactment of the tribal dances of yesterday. And they used to carry real spears, but many people inadvertently got hurt, and so they carry poles today. In the palace in Addis Ababa, the man who is tying together all of these diverse elements and peoples of Ethiopia, the Lion of Judah himself. A very shrewd man, a very sensitive man. We all remember his League of Nations speech, defying a modern European army. His point was that there should be equal rights for all nations, including his. And the Ethiopian flag reminding us that Ethiopia is the only country in Africa that never really bowed to colonialism. Thank you very much, Mr. Butler. Well, Mrs. Butler, it's easy to see why you wanted so badly to return to Ethiopia. You've both proved that it certainly is a fascinating wonderland for the world of adventure. Well, now, Mr. Butler, we, we've seen you with that souvenir. What is it, by the way? Well, this is an Ethiopian fly switch, Jack, and it's very useful. May I? You certainly may. It was given to us by the guardian of the royal crowns over in the sacred city of Aksum, a man who was perhaps one of the most Christian gentlemen I ever had the pleasure of meeting. He was 300 miles from the nearest camera store. He had never had a photograph made of himself. He requested that we take one, and when I offered to give it to him, he said, well, no, as a token of this occasion, you must accept my picture. And when I naturally refused, he said, well, then you must take my personal fly switch as a momentum. How very, very nice. Now, Mrs. Butler, perhaps this question has a touch of the Bridie Murphy uh, influence to it. I don't mean it that way, but quite seriously, were you able to identify the people and the places that had played an important part of your uh, 10 years in Ethiopia as a child? Oh, yes. Uh, all the buildings were there and a lot of the old friends, and I must have dragged Bill around saying this is where this took place and so forth. Uh -huh. But the, most, uh, the thing I enjoyed the most was seeing the rest of the country that I hadn't seen as a child. Surely. The backwoods country, particularly in the jungle and the veldt as well. Now, you had two sisters who were born in Ethiopia. Yes, as a matter of fact, there were six children in my family, and the two youngest girls were born in Ethiopia. Well, Mr. Butler, Mrs. Butler, I very much want to thank you for showing us these very lovely pictures of yours, and I think that we are quite fortunate to have as our guest two people who have such a genuine affection for the land they visited. Thank you, good luck, Thank Mrs. You. Butler. Thank you so very much, Mr. Willis Thank you, Butler. Jack. In just a few moments, highlights from next week's exciting action adventure. First, however, a last gentle reminder from Lee Goodman. Mmm, instant Ralston. That's the way to get off to a steam and start in the morning with the power of Ralston's whole grain wheat. Instant Ralston or regular Ralston. The power pack and cereals from Checkerboard Square. We journey deep into equatorial Brazil with Mr. Paul Crum of Henderson, Nevada to the unexplored jungles of Amapá. Mr. Crum and his guides must battle the swift rapids of the Jari River. A young jaguar ventures out unperturbed by the passage of the explorers. A rare black anteater takes to water in quest of food. The world's largest rodent, a capybara, is destined for a jungle cooking pot. Natives fish with enormous bows and arrows. Here's a jungle hitchhike, a whole family including the dugout on Mr. Crumb's outboard canoe. My thanks now once again to Mr. and Mrs. Willis Butler and as always to you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Thank you so much and good night. Bold Journey is brought to you every week on film by the Ralston Purina Company, Checkerboard Square, St. Louis, Missouri.